Hello, my name is Andrew Weens, and I'm Vice President of Government Relations for the Wichita Regional Chamber of Commerce. Thanks for joining for this video today. Uh, we're going to be discussing the congressional response to the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. Uh, many of you watching this video own, operate, or work for businesses that are looking for ways to survive. Uh, we're dealing with the spread of the virus, the economic downturn, and executive orders, including Governor Kelly's recent statewide stay-at-home order that went into effect actually this morning. We also want to recognize that there are people in hospital beds who are being treated by healthcare professionals who are literally struggling to survive. So in many ways, it's a new world from the one we were living in just a few months ago. Uh, with that being said, we're here to learn more about the congressional response to COVID-19. And so we're thrilled to be joined by 4th District Congressman Ron Estes, who represents Wichita and much of South Central Kansas in the U.S. House. He grew up on a family farm in Kansas and is an engineer by trade. After a successful career in consulting and management, he began serving the public as Sedgwick County Treasurer and then was elected Kansas State Treasurer prior to his election to Congress in 2017. Uh, we're also happy to be joined by the Wichita Chamber's Government Relations Committee Chair, Karma Mason. Karma is a Wichita native, a graduate of Wichita State University, a professional geologist, and co-founder of ISI Environmental. Karma and her husband Gary started ISI, ISI 30 years ago and ISI continues to provide common sense, environmental, safety, and health compliance solutions to this day. Finally, we're joined by the founder and president of Watkins Public Strategies, Jason Watkins. Jason serves as the Wichita Chamber's legislative consultant. He's owned multiple businesses during his career, is a former member of the Kansas House of Representatives, and now serves as a contract lobbyist. He spends many of his days in Topeka at the Kansas State House, advocating for the best interest of his clients, including yours truly, the Wichita Chamber. So, all right, with the introductions out of the way, let's talk about the COVID-19 response from Congress. Congressman Estes, uh, let me first start by welcoming you and thanking you for joining us. And then I just wanna give you the floor to say hello and provide some opening remarks to all of our business members and your constituents. Well, great. I, I wanna start off by uh, giving my thanks to you, uh, Andrew and, and Jason and Karma, uh, just for having this opportunity for uh, me to talk about some of the things that are going out there Obviously, your members have uh, a big concern and, and a big interest in this, and we want to want to make sure that we've uh, focused on addressing some of those issues that are out there. Uh, I, I want to start off a little bit by saying uh, my thanks to all the folks that are on the front lines of this battle. You know, this is unprecedented times that we're at, and uh, all the healthcare providers who are actually working to actually protect us, to actually make sure that the sick get healed, making sure that uh, uh, they take care of themselves, to uh, take care of all the other ordinary everyday things like car accidents and heart attacks and, and making sure that uh, we're addressed. And uh, as well as uh, support for the EMS and, and law enforcement and, and fire and police in terms of the issues that they're addressing. I want to talk a little bit uh, when we go through some of the questions and answers uh, about some of the things that we're doing at the federal level to help make this happen. Uh, obviously, we've looked at both the medical issues that uh, we're dealing with, as well as the economic issues that are surrounding this, and how do we uh, continue to focus on moving forward there. The president's uh, assigned a task force to actually go work on this coronavirus and address some of the the healthcare issues, the emergency management issues, uh, some of the economic issues that we're, that we're running through as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as we go through this. And uh, I know as most of you probably already know, uh, the president extended uh, last night through April 30th, uh, his, his request that uh, we, we minimize the, the activity we do, that we actually do a, 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 without a nationwide shutdown order, uh, at least uh, us as individuals are looking at how do we uh, manage uh, our own involvement, our own time, our own interaction with uh, friends and family members and coworkers, and and how do we operate uh, under the the statewide orders, uh, particularly with uh, Governor Kelly's new order that, as you mentioned, started this morning. Great, thanks, Congressman. Well, let's keep things rolling. By I'll start off with the first question here. So Congress has passed kind of three major pieces of legislation in response to the coronavirus. Can you just give us the ultra high level view of what those three bills were intended to do? Yeah, so we'll start off with the first one uh, we passed uh, a month ago now. Uh, it was focused primarily on, on the healthcare issues. So as we were rolling forward, how do we get uh, testing and making sure that that's being addressed and, and that we're funding through that. Uh, if, I think as we as we get through this, I mean, there'll be there'll be enough time to analyze this disease, analyze what's happened. Uh, but one of the things that I think we saw was that the um, 
the bureaucratic approach that was started out on testing uh, slowed some of that process down. Now that we've got private sector involved in, in helping build testing kits, we're, we're getting uh, uh, more of those ready and rolling out. And, and so I think uh, we're gonna see more cases being reported, uh, but part of that's a function of uh, additional testing kits being available. So that's, that's good that it's out there. Uh, the, uh, the original effort, uh, the, the reagent that was in the testing uh, kit wasn't working as well in the field as, as it needed to be. So uh, now we're seeing a change in that process going forward. The other thing we wanted to do in that first package was uh, make sure that we provided funding for uh, development of antivirals, uh, some of the treatment uh, options and, and capabilities, as well as make sure we had funding prepared uh, for a vaccine. What the, uh, the experts are telling us is that, you know, it looks like it's gonna be uh, probably months. Um, it could be uh, a few weeks, but more than likely it's gonna be into late summer or fall when we have uh, uh, better treatment options out there. Uh, there are several things that are being developed. Uh, obviously we're seeing right now uh, a lot of news around use of uh, hydroxychloroquine and zithromycin as uh, 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 tools to combat that. Uh, and the FDA actually just uh, released that as being uh, treatment uh, to move forward with that. So that, that's good to, to have that available. Hopefully we'll get some, some targeted things that are actually uh, gonna help going forward as well. The second bill that we passed uh, two weeks ago, um, or three, two and a half weeks ago, I guess now, is was focusing on how do we help uh, workers? And uh, it, its primary focus was how do we make sure that people that were sick uh, would stay home so that they could get well, and, and if people had family members that were sick at home, uh, that they had the, fl the flexibility to stay home as well. We wanted to make sure that uh, they were they were funded so that uh, you know they, they felt like they were you know, getting paid leave uh, in order to, to take care of that, uh, and also making sure that it didn't was was not too disruptive to the business environment in terms of having to worry about people. Uh, obviously, with this virus, uh, as the things that are rolling forward, things changing quickly. I mean, changing every day in terms of what we knew, and uh, as we saw right after we finished that second bill. Uh, was that, that we needed to do more, uh, particularly from the economic impact of what was going out. So the third bill that uh, uh, we actually just passed this past week, uh, sometimes it's called the, the CARES uh, Act uh, in terms of looking at uh, con con uh, coronavirus relief. Uh, but it focused on how do we work within the business structure to help protect workers as well as, as protecting businesses so that we can get through this pandemic, uh, this uh, effort that we've got going on right now and get to the other side of it uh, with the workers being protected as well as the, emplo uh, the employers and the companies being protected. So it really was broken down into uh, several different categories. And uh, the first one talked about workers and, and how do we uh, support folks that are um, unemployed and, and make sure that we had uh, some additional funding in the unemployment pool to help support them in that arena. We also uh, looked at from a tax standpoint, uh, which is one of the things we do on Ways and Means Committee is uh, how do we make sure that people have uh, money in their pocket? And so there's a tax rebate that's going out. Uh, every taxpayer um, is going to get $1,200. Uh, if it's a joint tax return, it, it'll be uh, double that. And then $500 for child, uh, which follows the, the same as the, the child care, um, dependent care uh, criteria. So uh, that's gonna put money in people's pockets uh, starting the, the first week of April that people will have available for some of their expenses. I wanna talk a little bit about uh, small businesses, which was the other primary piece that we wanted to focus on is how do we support uh, those businesses. Um, backing up a little bit, uh, the, the, there's a, a generic definition of small businesses that we use, uh, basically less than 500 employees, uh, looking at uh, as a size there. And so we wanted to create some avenues that uh, encourage and support businesses to keep their employee, your employees working. Uh, did a couple different programs uh, that uh, employers, uh, companies could have the option of picking from. Uh, one of them was a tax credit, 50% uh, tax credit, uh, up to $10,000 for uh, the salaries that are being paid to their employees, or a loan program, uh, which is forgivable, 
And so it basically calculates uh, two and a half times the salary uh, of, a, of a business uh, and uh, being able to use that money to pay, pay wages, pay interest on, on mortgage, pay rent, pay utilities. And the, the overall goal is to make sure that the business survives and to get through this to the other side. And then the last area I want to talk a little bit about um, was uh, uh, some, some bigger provisions. Uh, in, in most cases, it's going to go to larger uh, employers, larger companies, uh, but uh, there's a, a large pool of uh, $500 billion going out, uh, targeted some specific targeting towards aviation industry, uh, some uh, $500 billion, or excuse me, $50 billion for aviation industry, $8 billion targeted towards cargo industry, $17 billion going towards um, uh, defense-related industry. And then the uh, other $425 billion uh, is going out to, to be available uh, for uh, uh, what's called an economic stabilization fund uh, to help, uh, economic stimulus fund, to help focus on how do we make sure that uh, other businesses that might need support. We're going to see that. Uh, with a lot of our aviation folks that are already suffering through the 737 MAX issue and how do we move forward there. Um, and then also other industries like uh, auto industries and, and other things. We were able to get one other provision, uh, just want to mention in here, uh, that uh, we were really an advocate for and uh, fixing the, uh, the qualified improvement uh, program, uh, basically depreciation. Uh, that was a cut and paste error uh, done by a clerk in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act when it came forward uh, to expect businesses to depreciate over 39 years. And so we were able to get that back to what the intention was in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act to be able to, to shorten that back to what makes realistic sense on uh, depreciating expenses. Great, thanks Congressman. Well, you covered a lot on the CARES Act. Uh, broadly speaking, Congress's goal, the President's goal, um, in passing this stimulus bill was to get things moving again because of all the shutdowns and the need to, or stay at home orders and the need to kind of nip this virus in the bud, if you will. Uh, can you just talk about kind of the, the overarching goal to try to stimulate the economy and how you think this bill will achieve that? Yeah, so, so really, uh, you know, when we, when we took a step back and we looked at this, the, uh, the process that we did with the third bill was uh, different and more comprehensive than what we did with the second bill. Um, the third bill, the CARES Act, uh, we wanted to focus on how do we address the specific issues that were out there. So uh, the lead was taken by the Senate. So basically the Senate Republicans and the Senate Democrats worked together to, to actually uh, take the respective committees, focus on those particular areas, and, and focus on, on what do we did need to do moving forward. They actually involved us from the House side uh, on our respective committees, whether you deal with health issues, whether you deal with tax issues, uh, making sure we address that. And, and the goals there were, how do we make sure that our, our economy, uh, which is, is struggling right now because of all the government mandated uh, restrictions and slowdowns and, and stay at home orders, uh, but we want to make sure that uh, the economy could get through this process. We know it's a major impact. We know it has a lot of crisis. We also know that uh, owners of businesses, uh, they want to get through this. They want their businesses to survive once they come through it. So our focus was on how do you support the business uh, through lending, through cash flow, through making sure that uh, they had the right liquidity uh, to get through this process, but also make sure that it was flexible enough so that it wasn't a, a burden on the business. Uh, and that's why we came up with the, the small business loan program which actually could be converted to grants uh, to, to help support uh, that business. Uh, our, our focus there was how do we make sure that um, uh, the employee is, or the employer is, is uh, encouraged to help keep their employees on staff, uh, keep them working uh, so that they have paychecks coming in. Wanted to give a couple of different flexible options. Uh, some people uh, would prefer the forgive of a loan process. Some would prefer uh, getting the tax credit over that process. And so that was our overwhelming goal. And then the second piece was just working on how do we help, how do we help those employees? Uh, if they are still working, uh, still able to have the opportunity to work, uh, uh, we wanted to help support them in that process. Uh, if for some reason they were unemployed, uh, that we were able to, to help with them uh, through that unemployment process. 
make sure that the unemployment the departments in the, in the respective states were supported and um, maintained as we move forward. So uh, those were the two primary goals we wanted to make sure uh, protecting both the business as well as the employees. Great. Uh, you already touched on it briefly, uh, but one of the things you mentioned was some of the assistance that was offered to particular sectors, uh, like the airline industry. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit more, maybe go into uh, some detail about you know, how the airline industry has been affected? And you can even maybe touch on your uh, travel story for getting to DC to take the vote last week, because I'm sure that was a little bit dicey. Um, and then maybe some of the other areas or sectors, you know, some money for transportation, just kind of high level before I pass it on to Karma for the next question. So, you know, as we, as we know in the, uh, uh, certainly in our area, in uh, uh, Wichita and South Central Kansas, the big impact that uh, the 737 MAX has already had on us and the amount of work that we've been doing uh, in the community to address that, to, to focus on what do we do moving forward. Uh, and, you know, when I talk about it in Washington, I talk about how we are the, have been the hardest hit uh, part of the country uh, because of that issue. And then you overlay this impact where basically it shut down orders. Um, and the aviation industry started looking at um, uh, several weeks ago, uh, just a huge drop off in passenger traffic, uh, starting back in, in January, at the end of January, uh, particularly to Asia uh, initially. So as the airlines started moving forward, they started canceling uh, first half their flights and then more than half their flights. And then uh, now for the most part, uh, all flights are stopped. Uh, there's only, uh, uh, most airlines have one, maybe two flights going into London and uh, uh, two or three going into uh, Tokyo uh, for an, uh, over into Asia. So it's, it's a major slowdown for the airline industry. Uh, when you look at uh, what's going on across the country, uh, every every few days, you saw airlines come back and, and cut back flights. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, my trip last week. So I went back on Thursday to do the vote. And, uh, of course, flying out of Wichita, uh, you had to connect. And I, I connected through Chicago on the way into Washington and through Minneapolis on the way back. Uh, the uh, The flight out of Wichita uh, was the, the, uh, the 145, uh, which you know, was brought 55, 60 seat plane, there were 12 of us on the plane uh, flying into Chicago. And uh, when I got to uh, Chicago, the, the uh, uh, 320 that we flew from Chicago into, uh, into Washington, D.C. had uh, 25 people on it. So a plane that normally would have 120, uh, few, few people flying uh, nowadays. Uh, and a very similar story on the way back. Uh, in fact, in the matter of coming back, the reason I flew through Minneapolis was uh, the evening flight through Chicago was uh, canceled. I mean, they, they didn't have it flying. So ended up flying through Minneapolis on the way back. A very similar story, flying back on a 737. And uh, there were uh, less than 20 people on the flight from Washington uh, into Minneapolis. And there were supposed to be 12 people on our flight from Minneapolis into Wichita. And there were a couple that didn't, didn't make it. I don't know whether they, their connections were missed or whether they just chose not to fly. So uh, obviously that's had an impact on the airline industry. I mean, the, the airlines can't fly I mean, a plane. They, they, they lose money on each of those, just uh, the amount of money they spend on fuel uh, going through the ticket prices. So obviously there's been a big impact there. And that's why we wanted to carve out particularly uh, those distressed industries, uh, airlines, the uh, lodging accommodations industry uh, were two that were massively hit with this um, reduction in travel and the stay-at-home process. So we wanted to make sure that those those were addressed, as well as uh, cargo traffic, uh, particularly the the trade issues that we've got uh, that we have uh, between the United States and Europe, between the United States and Asia. A lot of that's been cut back as well. So we want to make sure that those industries were supported and and uh, we're seeing a lot of impact with, with hotels and lodging uh, arrangements. We want to make sure they're supported as well. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's, uh, these, these aren't loans to the bigger businesses. Uh, they're, they're, they're not bailouts. They're, uh, they are loans. Um, they are, uh, the intention is to make sure that um, we support the industry, let them get back on their feet, uh, but make sure that uh, 
um, we're not we're not trying to unduly uh, weigh too much on the scales. I, you know, as a fiscal conservative guy, I, I have a hard time uh, spending this much money, uh, but we're at the point where uh, this was a mandated situation by by the government because of the the health crisis, and so we had to make sure that our industries got got supported and and got through this process as well. Thank you. Yeah, seeing just lots of impact across sectors. So thanks for sharing that story with us as well. And I'm going to pass the torch over to Karma and ask her to ask the next couple of questions, which should be particularly insightful for small businesses. So Karma, take it away. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I really feel honored to be able to participate in this conversation. Uh, there's no question that small businesses have been very quickly and significantly impacted by this pandemic. Uh, but I am extraordinarily encouraged by what the government has been doing in regards to small business. So many times you hear about what government is doing for larger businesses, but there has really been a tremendous emphasis on this for small businesses and its employees. And I just right off the bat wanna thank you, Congressman, for your efforts particularly with this CARES Act, it's greatly appreciated. But could you maybe tell us uh, more about what qualifications are gonna be or need to be met by small businesses to be able to qualify for a PPP grant? Okay, yeah, let's talk about that. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, the our primary focus was was how do we support those small businesses, as, as you mentioned, and, and you know uh, firsthand uh, what the issues are that you face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, a lot of the larger companies, they have a, a bigger bank account. I mean, they have more wherewithal. They have a bigger line of credit that uh, financial institutions are are backing and supporting them. So it makes it a whole lot easier for them to, to weather a storm like this, whereas the smaller businesses that... Uh, you know, rely more on, on what's going on day to day or week to week, uh, it's a bigger impact. So when we look at that, the overall criteria that, that we were picking was, was just a, a gross definition of 500 employees and less than that qualified as a small business. Uh, so we started to get into uh, some of those issues when you look through that as well is, okay, well, how does that affect? I mean, if you have a, if you're a franchisee and, uh, you know, own, nine nine McDonald's, nine fast food restaurants, you could be over the 500 employee level pretty quickly in that process. So we wanted to make sure that uh, it, it was also tied to physical location uh, for those franchisees in the, in the uh, uh, accommodations and restaurant industries so that uh, they, they would be able to, to partake in this as well. And when, when we look at what we want to accomplish with this, uh, our overall goal is making sure that we address um, the short-term liquidity needs, making sure that you have the cash flow uh, to keep the business open, knowing there's been a major hit uh, on all industries of, of revenue and, and just the concern that you don't know where the business is going to be next week and your customers don't know what their business is going to be, so they're less likely to, to be involved with you. So when we looked at uh, uh, that we wanted to make sure that we had a broad enough category uh, to include as many businesses as possible and provide the, the loan and the, and the tax credit program to as many businesses as possible. With some of the uncertainties moving forward, um, do you have to show immediately a revenue reduction or an immediate revenue reduction to qualify for this loan? Or if you anticipate a downturn, like over the next couple of months to your business, can you go ahead and apply for one of those loans? So my, what we're really, uh, what part of our definition is uh, making sure that you're a business uh, in business as of February 15th. Uh, and that's, that's really the, the, the one criteria that tied with the 500 employee headcount. So, uh, and then it's up to you to manage how your operation is. So you, there, there's very, very few restrictions on what you have to qualify for. You don't have to show that you're losing revenue. You don't have to uh, come back and, and show a dire need. Uh, what you, when you look at the, these programs, what we wanna do is make sure that um, you can get the money as fast as possible. So uh, 
over the weekend, Secretary Mnuchin and, and Larry Kudlow both said that the Small Business Administration is going to have their uh, website up and running by Friday of this week. So we'll be able to, to start that process. We also recognize that the Small Business Administration is going to be swamped uh, with applications. So we wanted to make sure that uh, we extended uh, capabilities through financial institutions, banks, credit unions, uh, any regulated uh, uh, lending institution would be able to help with this process uh, to get these uh, government-backed loans uh, in their hands as possible, as quickly as possible. Uh, so uh, there aren't any other criteria uh, beyond that in terms of, of, uh, of being able to qualify. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit, uh, and, and we may want to, to get into that in a little bit more details uh, later in terms of, of uh, the loan forgiveness program that's tied to uh, uh, these small businesses. And I don't know if you want to ask that, uh, is that one of the questions that are going to come up? We'll, we'll get to that in details. Okay, yes, that actually is one of the questions that I have for you about that loan forgiveness. And we may as well go ahead and go to that one. Um, now, I understand that uh, uh, when a, a small business uh, receives one of these PPP loans, a grant, that the forgiveness is possible depending upon what the use of the monies are for. And I guess one of the questions that I have is, you know, Who's, is the business responsible to track that and what agency uh, or is it a, their personal bank where they got the loan? Who do they report that information to? We've got to make sure that we're tracking the correct information and in the, in the manner that it needs to be presented for the forgiveness. And there's a second part to that, if you, if you bear with me, Congressman. Um, I understand that these loans can be forgiven or partially forgiven based on what the monies are spent for. But is that an all or nothing proposition on that forgiveness element? Yeah. So, so let's, let's talk a little bit of, uh, in some, some broad generalities in terms of how we go through this process. So we, we assuming your business was started February 15th, which um, we're, we're working through that process or you'd work through that process and you're, and you're less than 500 employees and, and you want to focus on how do you help with your cash flow? So you can, you can apply through the SBA. You can talk to your uh, financial institution, bank or credit union, uh, whatever you use as uh, as your, your financial institution, uh, talk about your need. And what we try to do is figure out how do we calculate a way to get uh, the, the right amount of money or the best amount of money, optimum amount of money uh, in the, the business's hands so that they can use them for their immediate needs. And so where we, we came up with a calculation was that uh, two and a half times uh, your payroll is the loan amount you can, you can uh, apply for. And uh, what you can use this loan for is to pay payroll for your employees, to pay rent, or to pay interest on a mortgage, if you have that, um, and to pay utilities. And so uh, it's, it's, when you look at the payroll costs, when you look at the things that, that are included in that, uh, you know, the typical things that you, you have with, uh, with payroll is uh, your salary, you have uh, health benefits, you have the other issues that you uh, work to support your, your employees. And so that's, uh, that's what you can apply to, uh, to include in the amount that you're qualifying or applying for the loan for. And then uh, you can actually use that to pay any of those costs uh, during that time period. The forgiveness portion comes back is that uh, up to eight weeks of, uh, of your payroll, uh, the loan will be forgiven uh, in order to help uh, pay back um, or recognition, I guess that uh, this is uh, an area that's outside your control. It's, out, it's, a, it's a government mandated process that we, we try to uh, corral the, uh, the healthcare issue and, and address that. And so uh, that's, that's where the forgiveness comes in. Uh, there doesn't have to be any criteria on whether you spend it all on payroll or versus spending it on, on your, your rent or utilities, uh, but the cash flows there when you need it. And the whole intention is to help the business stay whole through the process and then also have 
uh, as much employees still getting a paycheck so that when we're through the other side of this, this epidemic, that we'll have uh, the employees that are ready, willing, and able to come back to work. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, it really is a complex uh, grant process that's made as simple as possible based on everything that I have seen to this point. It really uh, is, and I, I would, sorry to interrupt there, Karma. One of the things I would just mention is I would encourage you to reach out to your financial institution now. They may not have all the answers to the questions today that you're asking them, uh, but at least start that process and, and get involved with uh, uh, going through that because they, um, you want to make sure that you start that, that dialogue with them uh, so that they know you have an interest. An interest. And that's a very good point. Uh, it re leads right to my next question. And it's my understanding that the price tag uh, for this is about $349 billion for the small business piece of the CARES Act. Um, now, what happens when those monies are gone? Is there, is there any conversation going on about that? Um, so the timing uh, is what we what we put in the bill is having that uh, 350 billion dollars out there ready to to uh, borrow against. Um, the bill just says that's the amount that's available. Uh, realistically, what I expect to happen is lots of people are going to apply, lots of people are going to uh, uh, take loans. Uh, we don't know if the full amount's going to be used. Uh, if it is, I expect that we'll come back. I mean, there's already discussions about another bill. I think it's too early to draft that other bill yet, but uh, I, my expectation is that uh, we will come back and, and include in a future bill uh, additional funding to make sure that we, we address those needs. Uh, there's, no, there's no difference uh, with somebody that applies today versus somebody that applies uh, two weeks from now, and because that's when they had the need. Uh, we want to make sure that we're protecting small businesses all the way through this process, making sure that uh, they're, they're, they're covered so that their cash flow needs are addressed and, and that they can stay in operation. Thank you, Congressman. Um, are there any provisions in the Act for enforcement or penalty? I mean, we hear things like there will be piece to this, there will not be a personal guarantee piece to this, and I mean, essentially, will the small business owners be required to put up their houses and their cars as collateral? So uh, I'm glad you brought that question up. Um, you know, that's one of the things this bill took um, a little bit of time to develop. Uh, the Senate, uh, Democrats and Republicans on their respective committees uh, crafted the bill. And uh, in the process of negotiating over the next, the first three days of that negotiations, uh, there was some give and take back on different things. And uh, in one of the earlier discussion points was that there would be required a personal guarantee uh, by the a business owner to take out that, that, uh, that loan. And uh, that's not in the final bill. Uh, there is no requirement on the part of the, the business owner to, uh, to uh, do a personal guarantee. There's also not a requirement for collateral. I mean, these, these are government-backed loans that uh, we're standing behind uh, trying to set up and make sure that process uh, moves forward. So uh, that's, that's the process we wanna make sure that uh, it runs as smoothly for businesses to, to move forward and, and to get through this. Thanks, Congressman. I appreciate you answering those questions and um, we'll turn it back over to Karma in a little bit, but for now, um, I do want to turn it over to, as of, as of right now, he's been a wallflower, but Jason Watkins is anything but a wallflower. So I'm going to turn it over to Jason for a couple of thoughts and questions. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Uh, and appreciate being included in the discussion. I, I would just mention quickly that um, week before last, the Kansas legislature wrapped up. That was an early adjournment uh, based on trying to get out of Topeka. Uh, but one of the things that, that they did uh, prior to leaving town, along with passing a budget, uh, was, a, was, was a major reform to the state's unemployment policy uh, for unemployment insurance uh, and extended that from 16 to 26 weeks, 
and also eliminated the waiting week. Uh, and as I've shared, it was a, a very quick turnaround. That bill had a hearing at, at eight o'clock that morning. Uh, by 3.05 that afternoon, uh, it, had, it had passed out of both chambers of the legislature uh, and was on its way to the governor who signed it, I think, the next day at about noon. So with that said, Congressman, and good to see you, appreciate everything that you're doing. Uh, can you tell us a, a little bit more about the extension of unemployment insurance benefits uh, and increases in the weekly benefits that were included in, in the Federal CARES Act? Okay, great. I'm glad you asked that question because there's, there's several different provisions uh, related to unemployment insurance and uh, just, just talking through those in general. A um, uh, couple things. I'll start off with, uh, with the time uh, amount of unemployment insurance. So uh, one of the things we recognize is that it may take some time uh, to, uh, to move through this crisis and it may take some time for uh, some businesses to get back to for full speed. Uh, so even though the economy was going great in January and February uh, before this hit, uh, recognize that you know last week we had we had the the largest unemployment filing for one week. You know three over three and a quarter billion or three and a quarter million people filed for unemployment. So uh, there's there's a lot of people that are that are now moving into unemployment. So we expect as we move through that process. Uh, so we we added 13 weeks. Uh, to the federal cap. Federal cap was 26 weeks. Uh, so now that's moved up to 39 weeks. And uh, we're still working with the uh, Department of Labor here in terms of um, whether that would require uh, legislative change on the part of, of Kansas or not. Uh, but we want to make sure that that process goes as smoothly as possible. In addition to that, also increase the uh, the dollar amount that uh, each unemployed person could get uh, through that process. And uh, I'm not sure I, I I don't like the exact wording of the way that came out, uh, but it's going to end up with uh, an increase in money that's being paid uh, through unemployment to everybody that's unemployed. Uh, so that'll be a benefit for them. Uh, that provision uh, up to $600 a week is uh, um, is going to run through through uh, end of uh, through through June, uh, and then the uh, the 39 weeks runs through the end of December for this year. Another area that we did was we focused on uh, how to expand that beyond your traditional employee of uh, a, a company, and and so we said not only do we want to help uh, workers, but we want to also help the self-employed. Also want to help people that are in the gig economy. So uh, all all those categories would qualify for unemployment uh, through this process, and that and there was funding in the bill to do that. And then lastly, uh, there was additional money uh, put into the bill to help make sure that we support the staff at the Department of Labor's in each state uh, who are having to go through this process, and and in some cases having to change their IT systems, uh, in some cases having to have uh, uh, more clerks on the line answering the phone, helping uh, enroll people in, in unemployment insurance and making sure that process happens. I spoke with Secretary Garcia uh, last week about this and, and one of the things she asked me to strongly encourage everybody was to use electronic filing. Uh, if you're having a, a large layoff, use uh, uh, a file by spreadsheet process that they have. Uh, it'll help help them get people enrolled faster, it'll get your, your employees uh, enrolled into the unemployment process faster and smoother. And, and at the end of the day, uh, people will be able to get their unemployment uh, compensation to help them with their, their rent, help them with the uh, food and the costs that they have to, to take care of their families. Yes. Uh, th thank you, Congressman. One of the, one of the reasons the legislature moved so quickly on unemployment uh, benefits at, at the state level uh, was really related to talent. Um, we have a lot of talented Kansans. We want to keep them in this state. Uh, and, and we know we're going to come out of this crisis at some point. Uh, if Kansas lags behind a little bit, we don't want to lose those talented Kansans to states who, who, who might be improving a little more quickly than us. So uh, I, I think that's a, a key thing to keep in mind. I, the state maximum is, is around $488 a week. So don't hold me to that, but it's pretty close. Um, that's the max. You're saying that, that the federal government will be sending uh, up to an additional 600 a week. So, so those two amounts would go together. Um, 
to for somebody on the top end could be getting a thousand dollars a week no i think they'll go up to six hundred dollars a week um that's part of what we're we're uh um making sure that process works but i think it goes up to six hundred dollars a week okay so the so the federal money gets it up to six hundred it's not an additional six hundred right that um We'll, let's get, we'll get with the Department of, of, uh, of Labor, make sure that process works. But that was the, uh, uh, the, the way the, the bill was intended uh, to, to make sure that we address that. Okay, great. We actually received a, a really specific question from a chamber member that was asking um, if somebody was on disability or social security and they were working part time, um, would they still be eligible for any type of unemployment at all? And that's a pretty specific question that may, you know, require some good old fashioned casework by some of your staffers, but can you speak to, to that at all? Yeah, we, we may need to go back and, and research into that, um, uh, that, that part-time uh, disability or a part-time unemployment uh, aspect. One of the things that, uh, you know, of course we've been doing in Kansas for a long period of time is, uh, you know, work share process and, and addressing that part time. So uh, we want to make sure that that uh, works as well for, for most people. So that, let's take that question back and maybe we'll come up with some answers for you uh, to, to move through that. Um, one of the things I did want to mention, I, I, you mentioned uh, somebody on disability or, or uh, uh, social security and uh, that's one of the other criteria is for individuals to get the $1,200 check. So if somebody wasn't working, uh, but getting social security, so they didn't have any other income, so they may not have filed income taxes, uh, they would still qualify for the $1,200 tax rebate uh, based on getting social security. So um, that's a slightly different scenario than you asked the question about, but I wanted to make sure I made that comment as well. Yeah, ab absolutely. Very good and very helpful. It, it will be interesting to see how the Kansas Department of Labor implements these different changes and, and, and works with the folks at the federal level. Uh, obviously, a lot of work uh, left to be done there. And, 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 and frankly, understandably, there's still some unknowns. So uh, pr appreciate your efforts to help the state uh, work with the, with the folks out of D.C. Um, another question that we received uh, was challenges that are faced by entrepreneurs and startups with angel investors and other private investment for business startups having lost significant investment capital. Uh, does the act provide any relief to these startups? Yeah, it, it does. And uh, it depends on, we want to make sure that we address the criteria uh, correctly. So one, if the business was started up by February 15th, again, that's, that's the magic date. Uh, as an as an ongoing operation, and uh, if they have not received any venture capital money, uh, they certainly would qualify as an ongoing business. Now, if the Part B scenario happens, and if they have uh, received some venture capital funding, um, then uh, the rules get a little bit more complicated from the standpoint of you look at what else is that venture capital funding doing. And so the, the thinking in the way the law was written was um, these private equity companies who may have uh, multiple ownerships of different companies uh, wanted to make sure that how do you address whether they meet the 500 employee criteria or whether they're over it uh, based on the number of companies that they've acquired through that process. So it takes a little bit extra calculation uh, if that startup company has received venture capitalist uh, capital funding is how does that tie back to with what uh, uh, what that venture capitalist is doing and and how they handle their funding, but if if for some reason uh, any startup in general that was uh, an ongoing concern uh, by February fifteenth uh, would qualify. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've heard the IRS is allowing tax credits for emergency sick leave. Um, prior to April first, however, the Department of Labor will not allow companies to apply uh, for sick leave prior to April 1st as part of the required two weeks of, a, of emergency sick leave that the employers are mandated to provide to employees. Is there a good policy reason for the April 1st date? It seems like things are moving so fast and a lot of business owners are, are having, having to make payroll decisions on the fly. Yeah, so that, that's a good question. The, uh, the April 1st date 
came from the second bill, uh, the family first bill, when we were looking at the uh, sick leave and the, uh, the family leave uh, provisions. So the, the reason we wanted to look at, at uh, uh, April 1st was to allow Department of Labor time to write the rules and, and get those set up uh, after that, uh, that first bill. And so uh, that's where the date was picked from. Uh, that may be some things that uh, change in the process. We may need to uh, uh, do a little bit more research on that with the Department of Labor. One of the things we've, we've got is some, some resources out there uh, that you can look at. Uh, so on our, on our website at uh, estes.house.gov uh, slash backslash coronavirus, uh, we've got some uh, uh, provisions out there to help and, and some resources and some links, uh, as well as being able to get to the Department of Labor to, to answer some of those questions. Great, thanks Congressman, and thanks Jason for asking those questions. So as Jason mentioned, the uh, Chamber did receive a few questions from our members. Um, and I'd like to ask one of them at this time. So we received several questions phrased a little bit differently, but all focusing on the idea that the bill maybe contained some, the, the CARES Act contained some pork barrel spending or some bailouts for Wall Street, uh, that kind of thing. Um, as you know, constructing and passing legislation has been referred to as, you know, making sausage. Um, it's not a pretty sight, you know, messy process. And it's difficult because you have to get, you know, half of the members of the House and members of the Senate to support something that the president will sign. Uh, so can you speak to the process and maybe concerns of those unhappy with what the bill may or may not contain? So, you know, overall, I, I like, I really like so many of the provisions in the CARES Act. I mean, um, it, one of these things that the frustrating part for me, uh, trying to look at how do we make this governing process work is that, you know, coming from my business background is, when you see a problem, go out and solve that problem. And in the political arena, you, you go out and solve that problem, but you say, well, if it's important enough, I want to tack this on, I want to attach this on. And, and uh, so a lot of crap gets added to a bill through this process. And that was our problem with the second bill. Um, and, and so the, the process that went through with this, with this uh, the CARES Act, the third bill, um, was uh, much more focused on the goal that we wanted to achieve, which was making sure that uh, we supported small businesses, uh, helped them get through the cash flow issues, supported workers, um, we either uh, being on payroll or unemployment, and, and supported some of those distressed industries that were through that process. There's a lot of good things in there. Unfortunately, in the, in the middle of it, uh, it was attempted to be hijacked uh, by, by Nancy Pelosi in, in terms of that and uh, come out with all these wild ideas. I mean, they were going to put in the Green New Deal provisions. They were putting in a Medicare for all provisions. They were uh, adding a bunch of other things. Uh, and what that did was it created a lot of confusion around what was in the final bill. And we're still seeing things now uh, that either floating around on the internet or being talked about on, on uh, uh, media outlets that, that are in the bill and, and being addressed. And, and uh, it's, uh, there's not as much bad crap in a bill like in this bill that there is normally. Um, probably the things I, I uh, uh, like the least in this is uh, actually the, the amount of money that they put into the unemployment insurance. And, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. Uh, but having that extra $600 is kind of distorting uh, the, way, the way the calculation is. Um, the Kennedy Center funding, uh, which, uh, which Speaker Pelosi held us up for as a hostage to, uh, uh, to get that funding, which kind of interesting. Then they laid, the Kennedy Center laid off all their employees after they got the extra funding. So uh, that's kind of a, a slap in the face of the taxpayers that are actually doing that. So there, there are some provisions in there that, that I didn't like and, and where do we go from there? I did want to make one comment. Um, our, our, our crack research team is, has actually come up with uh, an answer going back to Jason's question. And, and uh, the, the Kansas Department of Labor has confirmed that it is an additional $600 on top of the $480. Uh, so that's a, uh, a huge provision uh, going into unemployment. Uh, the, the one caveat to that, is, as always, is it's not like somebody can quit and expect to get that money. As that they've got to be a, a legitimate laid off employee uh, going through that process. So uh, that's the concern we have is that uh, we want to make sure that uh, 
uh, people can um, uh, get support if they are unemployed, uh, uh, but uh, not be overly encouraged to uh, not work uh, because we want them working. I mean, that's the, the goal of a, a free market economy and keeping things moving. So luckily that provision ends, ends after June. Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, that, that uh, gets processed and, and moving forward. And, and uh, uh, then folks that really are in unemployment still have the, the extra 13 weeks up to the 39 weeks uh, that goes through the end of the year. Thank you, and thanks for clarifying that. It's certainly a balance when you're doing these unemployment changes. Is what you know? What is the government uh, incentivizing? And we had that same conversation. Um, Karma and Jason can attest. Our government relations committee, and we were pushing for the extending to 26 weeks for the state UI benefits. Um, and we looked at it as a talent retention mechanism. But you're right. You you want to make sure that you know unemployment isn't incentivizing people to not look for work. And so hopefully, you know, we can get the economy ramped back up again when it's uh, you know, safe to do so and, you know, take a, take a bite out of this virus and just kind of knock it back on its heels a little bit and get the economy moving again. So, uh, yeah, appreciate you clarifying that. I'm going to pass it over to Jason. Uh, let me flip it back to Jason for some last comments and then I'll move it on to karma and then you Congressman. So go ahead, Jason. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and, and thank you so much for taking the time uh, to, talk about these things with us today, Congressman. I, I would just quickly say uh, to our members and, and the folks uh, watching this, this recording, um, certainly these are challenging times. Um, there is uncertainty uh, with the economy. There's, there's still questions in terms of future actions that the state government and federal government uh, are going to take to assist. But I just re really want to strongly uh, encourage our membership to lean on the Wichita Chamber. Uh, the Chamber has a great staff, a uh, great team of, of professionals and experts, uh, and that's what they're here for. Uh, let, let them provide value to you during, during these challenging times. If you've got questions, uh, you, you need to figure out where certain resources are or how certain resources work, uh, reach out to the Chamber. Uh, we want to help you. Uh, I, just like the congressman does. And so uh, don't hesitate to, to reach out. We'll, we will get through this. Thanks, Jason. That's great. So Karma, I'll pass it on to you for some last words of wisdom, especially in relation to small business members, since you have experience in that area. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Uh, certainly most of us small business folks are entrepreneurs and we've all had to think out of the box many times for our business's sake. And this is no different. These times are no different, just a lot more stress. Uh, but we will do uh, anything that we possibly can that is legal <laughs> to protect our small businesses and our employees. Uh, what Congress has done for us, small businesses that is, uh, with this CARES Act has been to uh, buy us a little bit of time to uh, think through some of the things that we need to adjust our businesses to accommodate and to move forward. Uh, I appreciate that very much, Congressman, and I certainly want to thank you for all of your efforts on our behalf. Thanks, Carla. So, Congressman, I think you already mentioned your website, which provides some resources. I'm going to give you a chance to repeat um, some resources on the web that you think people could use, and business members and your constituents in particular. Well, great. I, would, I want to do, uh, um, just mention that our, our website, estes.house.gov uh, backslash coronavirus. Uh, we've got a lot of links out there that help. Uh, obviously, we've, we've been helping out with the, uh, their capital commitment and trying to work through this. So uh, a lot of the process that uh, we've been doing, the Chamber's been doing, so many people in the community have been doing, um, now we're, we're adding in the coronavirus issue to that dynamic and how do we work and make sure that we're, we're addressing uh, the needs of our community, help we uh, get the economy going again. Great. And I'll also just take this chance to remind viewers of the Wichita Chamber's resource page. Um, it's on our Wichita Chamber website. So it's wichitachamber.org slash COVID-19. Uh, it's called the Wichita Resource Center and includes a number of resources for employers as well as employees. So please check that out. And I think we're gonna post this video with Congressman Estes to that page as well, so you'll have access to it. 
Okay. So, Congressman, we've covered a lot of ground today. Appreciate you sticking with us through it and getting a chance to provide some education to your constituents and, and our business members. So, any last words for our members, the business community in South Central Kansas and across the state and uh, your constituents and district? Yeah, I just want to thank, thank the Chamber. Uh, thank you, Andrew and Jason and, and Karma, uh, in terms of having an opportunity to talk about this. Obviously, we're in unprecedented times. I mean, there's a lot of issues out there. We, at the federal level, tried to focus on uh, how do we support workers? How do we support small businesses? And how do we support some of those distressed industries and making sure that uh, even though it's a lot of money, there's a lot of money tied to this. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, the money got to the place it needed to be, that we used all the resources in terms of looking at uh, what's available, uh, utilizing the Federal Reserve, utilizing the Small Business Administration, uh, and helping make sure that uh, we can get to the other side of this. Businesses are supported. Uh, workers are supported so that uh, when we do get through with this, I mean, our, uh, which I fully expect we will, I mean, we're a resilient country and, and we're going to get through this and uh, we'll be ready to hit the ground running and, and we'll get the economy back up and going and, and we'll be going the way we, we were before this happened. So thank you again for your time. That's great. Well, thank you, sir. Thanks for taking the time to join us. I know there's a lot of demands on your time. Appreciate you. Uh, just taking the time. I know you had to go back and forth to DC last week and they might have you back before too long. So we appreciate your service to our state and uh, please tell Susan and the rest of the family that we say hello. Thanks to Karma and Jason for joining us as well and everybody stay healthy. Thanks for watching. Thank you.